It's another trip towing the teardrop trailer with our Tesla Model 3. This time, it's a three-night camping trip at the Upper Pines Campground in Yosemite National Park. I'm Frugal Tesla Guy, and I'll share with you what it was like getting there, how I was able to maintain a charge during our visit, and show you some beautiful pictures along the way. Yosemite National Park is and will always be one of my favorite places to travel to. And at just over 300 miles away from home, it's easy to pack up, get on the road, and be there in just one day. Now, since I had a reservation several months in advance at the Upper Pines campsite in Yosemite, it was time to plan my route. However, I had a unique challenge because I will be towing my teardrop trailer behind my 2018 long-range rear-wheel drive Tesla Model 3 and will be able to travel approximately 100 miles before I need to charge. Now, since we were leaving late in the day on Friday, I reserved a campsite at the Yosemite Pines RV Resort and Family Lodging, which is near Groveland on Highway 120, about 45 miles away from Yosemite Valley. That way, we could easily make the noon check-in time for our campsite on Saturday. So, let's get started. With a 100% charge and towing a teardrop trailer that is approximately 1,500 pounds fully loaded with gear, we were on our way. And our first leg was 103 miles to the Tesla Supercharger in Williams, California. Now, according to the trip computer, we would still have 50% of our battery, but since the Model 3 doesn't have trailer mode, it wasn't taking our teardrop into account. Now, once we did arrive, we still had 31% left, and the average energy used was about 415 watt hours per mile. Not bad if you ask me at all. Now, while we were charging, we were able to grab something to eat and drink, and 40 minutes later, we were up to 97% and on our way to the supercharger in Stockton, with a projected 32% left in the battery upon arrival. 102 miles later, driving at a speed of 60 miles per hour, we still had 22% left in the battery, averaging actually about 455 watt hours per mile. Now our efficiency did drop, but that was most likely due to lower temperatures and using the heater. 50 minutes later, we had a 99% charge and we were expected to arrive in Groveland near our campsite with 42% left in the battery. However, things started getting a little more tricky because we were going to see some elevation gains during this last leg, making it a little more difficult to predict how far we could go. 43 miles later and about 1,000 foot elevation gain, we still had 63% left in the battery, with 37 more miles to go and a little over 2,000 feet to climb. I decided to get a little juice at the supercharger in Copperopolis. We needed a bathroom break anyway, and we were only there for about eight minutes, adding about 12% to the battery and a little more peace of mind. Now, according to the trip computer, we would still have about 46% left in the battery. Unfortunately, by the time we arrived at our campsite at about 11.30 that night, I was pretty tired and actually didn't think to record the battery statistics, but according to my recollection, we arrived with closer to 30 to 35% left in the battery, and we would have easily made it without the top off in Copperopolis. After a good night's rest, we woke up with a full charge and with 50 amp service, so did the car. Now, since check-in at the campsite in Yosemite wasn't until noon, we had plenty of time to enjoy the petting zoo at Yosemite Pines RV Resort, where they had alpacas, goats, rabbits, and miniature donkeys. We also checked out some of the other lodging options. Although we had 100% charge, we didn't have cell phone reception until about a mile or two down the road, indicating we had 45 miles to go and would arrive at Yosemite National Park with 72% of our battery left. 
Now we had a little over 3,000 feet to climb before a long and steady elevation drop to Yosemite Valley, which is approximately 4,000 feet in elevation. We of course made several stops on the side of the road to check out some of the first breathtaking views of the valley. Once we arrived at our campsite shortly after about 11.30, our battery still had 75% of charge, which is actually 3% higher than estimated by the computer. After unpacking and setting up camp, we didn't want to waste any more of the beautiful day and got out on our bikes to explore the valley. We decided to take on the Mist Trail the next morning to Vernal and Nevada Falls, which is a popular hike and can get very crowded, so we decided to hit the trail early in the morning at around 7.45 so we could enjoy the sights with very few people on the trail. Now it's listed as a strenuous hike, and rightfully so, with a lot of steep climbs and several parts of the trail climbing stairs. Well, Vernal Falls is the first destination where a lot of people stop and turn around but we wanted to take it to Nevada Falls, which proved to be even more difficult, climbing up the base of Liberty Peak, but was well worth it in the end. pretty tired after the hike and took it easy the rest of the day and woke up the next morning to low clouds and rain. Now, although it did give us a unique perspective of the valley, it certainly wasn't as dramatic. Now, since the weather was less than ideal and we were leaving the next day, we decided to take a drive to the nearest supercharger in Fish Camp, which is about 37 miles away. It was a beautiful drive in the sense that we were eventually driving in the snow. And once we arrived, we plugged in and checked out the hotel and grabbed a quick bite to eat. And once we reached 100%, we headed back to the valley and the 6,000 foot summit was a little scary, but we did make it back safely and with 90% of the battery left. It was cold and wet when we got back and decided to hunker down in the teardrop until it quieted down. It actually got worse and did what we could do to stay warm, not only that evening, but the rest of the night. Everything was frozen the next morning but made for a beautiful sight. Our 
I was a little concerned about the road conditions on our way back home and decided to drive to Yosemite Village where I was able to plug in to get some charge. We grabbed a little breakfast and some coffee and after talking to a park ranger and seeing the road conditions and felt confident we would make it up and over the 6,000 foot elevation pass without any issues. By the time we got to our campsite to pack up, everything had thawed out, making for a warmer and easier experience. We were packed up and ready to go just in time for checkout, with 88% in our battery to get to the first supercharger in Groveland, just under 50 miles away. Now we took our own sweet time leaving because the valley was screaming at us to take more pictures. Now, according to the trip computer, we would still have about 68% charge left once we arrived at the first supercharger in Groveland. When we did arrive, we still had 58%. And not only was the supercharger almost full, but we only had the option to back in, meaning we would have to unhitch the trailer. Now, according to the trip computer, we still had plenty of charge to get to Copperopolis, which was another 39 miles, but only used 20% to get there, leaving us with 38% upon arrival. Copperopolis is a quaint little town with shopping and restaurants. We did get some ice cream while we were charging, and by the time we walked back, we had 98% in the battery and would make it to Woodland, about 100 miles away, with a projected 32% to spare. It wasn't too far off with 24% when we arrived. Unfortunately, we had no option this time but to unhitch to charge. But honestly, it doesn't take much time at all and is a very simple process. A little less than an hour later, we had 95% in our battery and were off to the Red Bluff supercharger which is about 115 miles away. And quite honestly, this is beginning to get into the upper end where I start getting a little nervous as far as having enough charge. However, I was also noticing the battery level dropping a bit faster than the way down. And that's because we were now dealing with a headwind. And at times I saw the car using a little over 500 watt hours per mile, which if you remember, it started at 415 watt hours per mile on the way down, eventually climbing to about 450 once we turned on the heater. Now my wife needed a bathroom break just in time for us to pull into the Williams supercharger along the way. It was a quick 10 minute charge, bringing us up from 63% to 78%. Now, according to the trip computer, we would have 25% of the battery upon arriving in Red Bluff but that headwind proved to be a range killer and dropped us to 15%. We definitely would have been cutting it close if we didn't stop for a quick charge in Williams. And honestly, we probably would have pulled into the Corning supercharger, which is about 20 miles closer than Red Bluff. Now we were only about 30 miles from home and only charged to 62% and made it home with about 30%. First and foremost, like many people, we can't get enough of Yosemite and try to get out there at least every two to three years. Now in my experience, April is the best time of year to go. Less crowds, especially on weekdays, and the waterfalls are typically flowing at their peak. Now this trip was the first time I ever experienced snow and it may not be terribly uncommon for snow in April. The weather has always been mostly sunny and warm for me. However, during the summer, it gets very hot during the day, sometimes over 100 degrees. And the crowds are quite honestly ridiculous to a point it's difficult to really enjoy the park. That being said, the Merced River is very enjoyable during the summer months for swimming or a relaxing trip in a raft. You can bring your own or even rent one in the park. Even though it's very busy in the summer, if you are able to wake up at the crack of dawn, you can get a few hours of peace and quiet at all of the main attractions before the crowds come out. To help cut down on that congestion, starting this year, 2022, between May 20th and September 30th, they will require reservations to drive through the park during peak hours between 6 a.m. and 4 p.m. But honestly, it will most likely still be way too crowded in my opinion. My best advice to enjoy the park is number one, get a campsite 
a canvas tent rental in Curry Village, or a room at the lodge. By staying in the valley, you reduce the headache of finding a parking space and it makes it a lot easier to get up early to beat the crowd. Number two, plan ahead. As mentioned earlier, you can reserve a campsite five to six months in advance, which is what I usually do, but all of them are almost always reserved within hours of the allowed date and time to make reservations. Now, I've never stayed in a canvas tent in Curry Village or used their lodging, but based on my research, you can book tents and rooms about a year in advance. Now, as mentioned earlier, the early bird gets the worm. In years past, even during the summer months, I would wake up right around sunrise and jog the main loop in the valley and only see a handful of people, even at the main attractions, including the lower Yosemite Falls Trail. It's very peaceful and well worth it. So now on to the burning questions. How was it towing a teardrop trailer to Yosemite and back? And how did I maintain a charge while we were there? Well, first and foremost, range anxiety in general has been long gone for years. But since I started towing, it has come back to a certain extent. And quite honestly, now that I have three trips under my belt with several kinds of terrain and driving conditions in general, I'm beginning to get a good feel for what kind of range I can get between charging stops. And soon, range anxiety while I'm towing will be eliminated. What I discovered early on, and even on this trip, is even while driving up and down steep grades and mountain passes, my typical range is still going to be about 100 miles. And as long as I plan for that, I know I will never run out of charge, especially as the supercharging network continues to grow. Not only were there enough superchargers along the way, but I had several buffers between chargers, giving me more than enough confidence to reach my destination. Now, what about maintaining a charge while staying in the park for three days? Thanks to Rivian, there are 11 level two options, although two of them are only for guests staying at the Awani Hotel. Eight of them are in the parking lot of Yosemite Lodge and one in the parking lot at Yosemite Village near the store. Is that enough? Well, simply put, no. Although there was only one time I couldn't plug in when I wanted to, during the busy summer months, it will most likely be next to impossible to find one available. As of right now, there are no charging stations in the Curry Village parking lot, which would have been a lot closer to our campsite, making it easier to plug in for a few hours, unplug, and park back at the camp. However, there is some light at the end of the tunnel because a supercharger is planned to be built about 15 miles away from Yosemite Valley at the El Portal Market and gas station on Highway 140. Now this will be the next best thing to a supercharger in the valley itself, but I don't see that happening anytime soon, but hopefully I'm wrong. With a supercharger this close, I think it will eliminate the anxiety of getting a level two charger in the valley especially if you go for a quick charge outside of the peak traffic hours. The lowest my charge ever got was 51% while in the valley, and that was after two nights of phantom drain and camp mode. The supercharging session in fish camp is a prime example of getting the quick charge needed for the next few days, but fish camp is too far away at 35 miles on a windy mountain road with a speed limit of 35 miles per hour which is why the L Portal Supercharger will be a welcomed sight. Now, it goes without saying, we had an amazing stay in Yosemite. And adding the element of towing a teardrop trailer with my Tesla Model 3 and maintaining a charge while we were there didn't really take anything away from the experience in my opinion. The cold nights in April did allow my son to at least sleep in a warm car with camp mode on only using about 10 to 15% of the battery each night, and maybe one of the coldest nights, about 20%. Maintaining a charge was not too terribly difficult, and with the addition of the supercharger not too far away from the valley, it will make it even easier. The only downfall? I did need to stop more often to recharge the battery, adding at least an hour or two to the trip. A sacrifice we were willing to make, especially with today's gas prices. And as we continue to take more trips with our teardrop trailer, range anxiety will become a thing of the past. 
Now I plan on continuing to document my teardrop adventures along with my overall thoughts of the future of towing, especially as we start seeing more electric pickups on the road. So be sure to check out my towing with an EV playlist for the videos I have made and will make in the future. Until then, you know the drill. Like, subscribe, and stay positively charged.